Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar this, uh, this afternoon on handling the aftermath of an OSHA inspection. Um, what we're going to be talking about today are, you know, we, we, we all had that fear about OSHA coming into our facility. And what we're going to be talking about is how do we handle that? So what um, Carl and I are going to be um, discussing is more on, okay, uh, once they're there, what can you expect? And then we're going to do a real shallow dive into um, how do you how do you handle that? What are your options? Um, so um, our presenters today um, are Mr. Carl Habakoff. He's a partner at Bugby and Conkle. Um, he's a certified occupational safety uh, specialist, certified occupational safety manager, and he's a certified workers' comp specialist with the Ohio uh, State Bar Association. Um, my name is Richard Barkham. I'm the owner of Cardinal Compliance Consultants. Um, I'm a certified industrial hygienist, certified safety professional, certified hazardous materials manager. And I personally have handled upwards around 40 either informal or formal contests with OSHA. Um, and, you know, coincidentally, the last one of those I handled was actually about four hours ago um, with the local Toledo area office. This is something that um, both Carl and I do on a very regular basis, um, which is why we, we think this information is, is extremely important to, um, to get out to everybody. So with that, um, if you guys do have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will get to those as soon as we possibly can. I do have everyone muted um, so we can cut down on background noise. Um, a couple of other um, things is, um, one, if you do need a certificate of attendance for your Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation safety training credit, um, please shoot me an email at rich at cardinalhs.net. Um, and, um, and we will get you that as soon as we, as we possibly can. With that, well, thank you, Rich. These are the. This is really sort of the outline of what we're going to do um, for the next 30 minutes to 60 minutes. We'll talk about the time frame that you have after you receive the citations and what you want to think about during that time frame. We'll talk about the types of citations and penalties, how you address. This situation many times depends on the citations you received and the penalties. And you will hear Rich, through this presentation, talk about know your why. Why are you doing what you're doing when you deal with citations and penalties? We will then discuss informal conference. What is an informal conference? What is the value of an informal conference? And what are you trying to get when you go to the informal conference. That's where you actually go to the local OSHA office and generally you will talk to the area director or the assistant area director about the citations you receive. It's a way to try to resolve this without going to a formal contest. And then we will talk about settlement, whether you uh, have good terms for a settlement or whether you think it makes sense to file an objection and take this into what we call the official OSHA court. Now, Rich comes at this from a very well-qualified safety professional perspective. I come at it from a lawyer perspective. But you will hear there's a lot of common viewpoints between the two of us, and this really some difference, but I would say 60 to 70% of the way we look at this is exactly the same. So once you get that citation, and what's going to happen is OSHA is going to show up at your facility. They're going to do an inspection. And what you will receive is within the next six months, and you heard me right there, within the next six months, you will get a certified letter. Okay, typically it doesn't take that long to, you know, to, to get you that certified letter. Um, but on the more complex cases, like a fatality investigation, like a multiple hospitalization, it, 
you might be looking at you know five months before you actually get something from OSHA. Now, once you sign for that certified letter, your clock starts ticking. And from that point, you have 15 working days. Now, these are government working days. So you take out holidays, you take out weekends, that type of stuff. So essentially three working weeks to, to, do, to, to do something about it. Now, you can do, you know, your options are, are, are a variety of things. Number one, you could sign it and be done with it. Um, you, pay the, you pay the penalty. Um, you um, accept their quick settlement agreement. So on, on some of these other than serious type, um, type uh, citations, OSHA might issue you the, or give you the option of a quick settlement, which is typically a 30% reduction right off the top. My recommendation is you never sign that, you never pay that without going through the process that we have outlined here and that first step is that informal conference, okay? And that informal conference is just that. It's, a, it's an informal um, meeting. You sit down at a conference table with either the area director or one of the assistant area directors, and you basically have the option of talking about anything that you want in relationship to that citation. Um, you could talk about abatement. You could talk about validity of the citation, you could talk about penalty, you could talk about abatement dates, abatement, you know, measures, all of that stuff. And if you agree to them, hey, you know, this sounds great, um, you know, you're going to reduce my penalty enough, um, you're taking it from a serious to an other than serious, you, 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 you feel comfortable walking, walking out of there. What will happen is the whoever you're with, the area director, the assistant area director, will step out of the room. They will draw up an informal settlement agreement. They'll bring it back in. You sign it. You pay the fine within the next 30 days. You're good to go. No problems. Um, and you move. You move on. If you don't agree with it, or you're not positive that you like it, you have the, as long as you're within this 15 working days, you can file a notice of formal contest. And basically, that's what, as Carl mentioned, that's what kicks it up to the OSHA courts. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as we as we get into this, because that formal contest, there's still some informal things you can do leading up to. Um, you have a, a very small window to still work with the local area office to settle some stuff. And that's when I think, Carl, a lot of people really don't understand it. They think that once you file that formal contest, you're you're automatically dealing with uh, the solicitor's attorney, whereas you can still, you know, kind of, kind of do things with the local office and still work things through. Absolutely. You, in fact, you and I have been on a case before where we did that. We, the, we ran out of the time limit. The 15 days was going to go, and so we hadn't resolved the issue, so we filed a formal contest, continued to work with the local office, and resolved it without any sort of formal litigation. Right. And in this case right there that you're talking about, um, that was actually a multi-citation multi type situation where we were able to informally settle all but this one willful citation. Right. And that's the only one that went through the formal contest, and that's something else that people don't realize. OSHA wants to settle these, as many of these cases as, as you possibly can at that informal conference. And that is your best option to get a, a favorable settlement because um, they will work with you. Um, and sometimes you might settle part of it, you formally contest the rest of it, you know, cut away all the, all the noise and just make things a lot easier to, um, to, to proceed forward. Now, when you get these citations, there's a multitude of citations. We're going to walk you through each of these in turn. You might get a, 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 what's called a de minimis citation. An other than serious, a serious, a willful. There's the dreaded criminal willful. Yep. Um, there's a repeat, and then there's your failure to abate. And each of these carry different criteria. Um, each of these carry a different penalty structure. So we want to walk through these just so you get these, you understand what um, what these are, are all about. Now, the first one is just the minimum. A de minimis citation is a citation with zero penalty. And really, 
if you look on the on the on the screen, really what this comes down to is that you didn't follow the letter of the law, but you still had extraordinary safety measures in place to to protect the worker. Um, you know, a couple of examples that I know that come to mind. I know there's interpretation letters out there on this. Is is the one. Um, you know, let's talk, you know, the employer complies with the intent of the standard yet deviates from its particular requirements in a manner that has no direct or immediate impact, okay? On this one would be um, spiral staircases. You're not supposed to have spiral staircases in your manufacturing facility. However, OSHA has said if you have them in place, you have them in place, and um, they were in place prior to the passing of this particular provision of the law. They will issue a citation, but they'll issue it under as a de minimis citation, which means that eh, slap your hand, you're not supposed to have it, but they're not going to assign any penalty because you're, if you're, as long as your staircase is still in, in good shape. Another one that I see coming up with this is the new fall protection standards in, in general industry. There's some provisions in there that over a period of time, you outlaw um, cages for ladders over 20 feet. They, they want a, some type of fall protection system for anything new putting in. And you have like 20 years to replace the, the old one. Well, you get 25 years from now, and if you still have one with a cage in, I could see OSHA coming in and issuing that as a de minimis because you still have something. You, you, you kind of get my, what, I'm, what right. I'm talking about there. Right. The other one, um, that um, that comes into play a lot that I think a lot of people are, are mis misinformed about is this last one, an employer's workplace place protections are state-of-the-art and technically more enhanced than the requirements of the standard and provides equivalent or more effective employee safety or health protection. Where I see this one come in and where I see, um, I see interpretation letters on this are on, for, on um, um, trailers, forklift loading trailers with forklifts. The regulation specifically requires trailer wheels to be chopped. It's exact, the exact wording in it. Well, now a lot of um, facilities have these dock lock systems that they're on an electronic sensor. The, the truck backs up into it. It hooks the, 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 uh, the bumper, and it keeps that truck from moving forward. Well, it's not the letter of the law, but it is an effective system. So in that case, OSHA could still come out and issue a, a citation for not chalking wheels, but it would fall under that de minimis requirement because you are protecting your workers. You're just not doing it in the way that they said they, they should do. Can I ask you a question, yeah. Rich? Um, and, to, and we'll get into this repeat citation a little bit later, but if somebody receives a de minimis citation, can that be the basis for a repeat? You know, technically, um, technically it could. However, um, it's zero penalty. Right. Um, I have heard of zero cases where that's ever been the case. Because really what they're saying is, look, you didn't follow the law. However, you still have something that's in place, okay? And where this might come into play is if you get a company that's really doing a bad job on everything else and they still want to just make note of this over here, you know, kind of that pouring salt in the wound a little bit is where I would see these. I've only seen a couple of de minimis citations in my career, and, and it's usually been in, in those types of in those types of okay. cases. Okay. Um, other than serious, okay. Other than serious, you can carry a penalty of up to nineteen thousand nine hundred and thirty or twelve thousand nine hundred and thirty-four dollars. Now this is up considerably over the last um, three years because in two thousand and 15, 2015, November of 2015, President Obama signed a bill basically mandating that OSHA take a look at their um, fine structure, their penalty structure, and reassess penalties or readjust their penalties up to the inflationary rates. And they're, now they're able to do that on a year-by-year -year basis. Well, previously to that, the citations were only $7,000 maximum for us for the other than serious or well as we'll see for the serious um what happened is it had been 25 years since osha had raised the rate 
So that was an 83% inflationary increase that they made in one fell swoop. So back, that was three years ago, it was at $12,460, I believe it was. And now, just as of January 1 of this year, it's up to $12,934. And so, you know, January 1 of this coming year, 2019, it'll go up. It will continue to go up as we go through. Um, and other than a serious citation, it is basically one that, hey, look, it's a violation, but um, most likely it wouldn't result in death, serious physically, physical harm, but it could have a, an immediate and direct relationship with the health and safety. This would be things like failure to um, record an incident properly, um, failure, you know, maybe you have a decent written program, but you're missing a certain provision in it that doesn't necessarily impact safety directly. Like, uh, let's say you have a HAZCOM program or a respirator program and you don't specify the, um, um, who the program administrator is, right? You still have your program in place, but you miss that one little piece. That would fall as an other than serious. Then you have serious, and this, again, it's up to $12,934, and this is where we're seeing majority of our citations um, come in at these days, and these are the citations that um, if you have a violation, it's uh, likely that if you expose an employee to that violation, that you're going to um, cause a, a, a death or a serious physical injury. Then we have willful, and this is when the dollar amounts really start driving up. Um, prior to that, um, you know, law being passed, that bill being passed in 2015, in November, November 10th of 2015, maximum for a willful was only $70,000. Now it's at $129,000 maximum. Um, and I know Carl and I have both seen willful citations over the past year, year and a half, that have both been above that previous maximum. So, I mean, you gotta understand when you issue these citations, we're having a, we see minimum and maximum. OSHA starts with the maximum. And we'll talk about some of the other stuff coming on later, but they start at that maximum and they start backing off based on a variety of factors that we'll, we'll talk about. A willful violation is where there's either intentional disregard of an act or plain indifference um, to employee health and safety. And when you start getting into a willful, um, and, and that definition of intentional disregard or plain indifference, um, it's important for you guys to understand exactly what that really does mean. And so I'm going to let Carl explain as you get more into the legal definition here. So with Carl, he's going to talk about intentional disregard. This is a very critical citation, if you have received a willful citation, you have problems. And you need to take notice of what OSHA is trying to tell you. So let's talk, let's look at the definition. Normally I don't like to read the text on a slide, but it's important that you understand what OSHA means by willful. There are basically two different definitions. The first one is that you are aware of the requirements and you didn't do anything about it. You knew there was a hazard, but you didn't abate the hazard. The, I suppose another example would be that you knew that um, uh, you're supposed to have guards on machines, but you decided that it really wasn't that important. You just didn't bother with the lockout tagout program, with any guarding on several of your machines, that is such an obvious, obvious hazard that it's impossible for an employer that has machines in the workplace to not know that you have to have a lockout tagout program when you're doing maintenance on the machine or that you have proper guards on the machines. So it's at that point where OSHA will impute to you, that means they're going to say you knew this or you should have known this, that this was the law, this was a hazard that you needed to address and you failed to address that. The 
other prong of the definition of willful is plain indifference. We have had clients that simply don't get it. They just don't understand that OSHA has um, standards and they have they have legal standards and there are hazards out there in the workplace and you never took the time to even care about it. We, um, an example would be, let's say, for example, that you have a machine that was uh, required to be guarded in a certain way. And you even bought a, a sample guard for this machine and you stuck it in a closet. You never did anything with it. That would be plain indifference to a safety hazard. So an employer may say, you know, I don't really, I wasn't aware that there were, were requirements in this particular area. I wasn't aware of the law. You should know that that is not a defense. You need to take control of the safety of your program safety in the workplace, if you don't do it, OSHA will do it for you. So ignorance of the law is no defense. So there are basically two prongs to a willful citation. One is an intentional disregard. You knew what the standard was and you failed to even try to meet the standard to abate the hazard that was there. The other one is you just didn't care. You just had no desire to cure the hazard that's in the workplace. Rich and I have both seen both of these willful citations come out both under plain indifference and intentional disregard. Um, and this is where it's a subtle, persuasive argument that can be made to the local office. I will say that willful citation receive a lot of attention for OSHA. They actually are reviewed by the mothership, is what I call them, the corporate headquarters in Chicago here in our region. So no matter what office you're in, if you're in, what region are we in, six? I think so. You're, the, the main guys in Chicago are gonna take a look at willful citation. So when they issue a willful citation, OSHA has spent a lot of time on them. So it's very difficult to have a willful citation reduced to a serious. We've maybe done it one time. I've seen it. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's also very expensive. Yeah, yeah you better take it serious when you see that you have a, uh, a willful citation. This is pretty much a summary of what I talked about. The um, doesn't have to be bad intent or malicious intent. It's just that this is a big deal and it's either voluntary or involuntary, but you are not addressing the hazard. Criminal willful um, comes about when somebody is killed in your place of employment and OSHA issues a willful citation. At that point, not only is the company at risk for a willful citation with up to $129,000 in, in, uh, in uh, penalties, but the case will also be referred to a prosecutorial organization, either the Ohio Attorney General's Office, the County Prosecutor, even the United States Solicitor's Office, that case is referred to a law enforcement agency and they can prosecute the owners and the officers of the corporation for criminal conduct. Um, and it's also important here to understand that they will not issue a criminal willful if the willful is based off of a general duty clause citation Correct. as well. Correct. Um, so, you know, again, as, as just as much as that, that willful citation it, there's, there's a certain legal burden that they have to meet and they really, they, they look at that with a very, very fine eye. Um, 
that goes even further when they look at, at criminal willful. Now, I have heard some rumors, and that's all these are at this point, is right now if you look at the criminal willful penalties, talking $10,000 an individual penalty and up to six months in, in prison, I have heard some rumors, these rumors have been going around for a while, yeah. that this could get kicked up to a quarter of a million dollar yeah. penalty and up to, I believe, five or ten years in prison. That's correct. I've, it's been the last couple of years right. I've heard that. Right. And, I, and, I, and, you know, and I would not, would not be surprised to see that happen sometime in the next probably three to five years. Um, honestly, you know, if you do meet that burden, um, it's almost like they're not going after some of these criminal willful, right? Um, because it's just really not worth not worth it. Um, so then we talked about repeat. Okay, um, our repeat citations again are up to 129,000 and some change on our on our penalties. Okay, in order for OSHA to issue a repeat citation, it has to be identical standard. Or it can be different, different but similar. For example, they issue me a citation for failure to have guardrails on a catwalk, on a walkway. Right? My guardrails are too high. Okay? Or they're too too low. They're they're, they're, not, they're not right. They're not right. So, <laughs> and uh, they issue me a citation on that. They come back a couple years later. They see my guys working off a of scaffolding. And I don't have guardrails on my scaffolding. I'm say 14, 15 feet up. That would be a different but similar type of citation. They can issue a a repeat um, for that. Um, and I want as we get through this, keep that in the back of your mind because I'm going to give you guys a one example of where I've been successful of reclassifying how they cited the case to prevent the willful or to, to prevent that repeat citation. And we are able to save $30,000 yeah. just because we were able to make a compelling argument to cite it not under this, Mr. Compliance Officer, but cite it under something else. Um, then we have this five-year limitation. Okay, this has just become extremely interesting in the last 60 days or so. Um, what it used to be, it used to be a three-year limitation. OSHA could only go back, what we thought could only go back three years on this um, um, to get you a repeat citation. Well, then they changed their field operations manual to say we can go back five years. Okay, well and good. You can go back five years. Um, just recently, um, what was it, the U.S. Circuit Court? Uh, U.S. Uh, Second uh, Circuit Court of Appeal. Okay. Yes. Issued a ruling on a case, uh, Triumph Construction Company versus U.S. Department of Labor, that basically, and, and I'm going to paraphrase here, um, that says that the field operations manual is a guidance document for OSHA. Um, and, and what Triumph had tried to argue is that when they were originally cited, it was a three year. Um, um, three years. Three, three years under the field operations manual. When they got recited, it was five years. The so OSHA went back five years. Well, they tried to argue, like, well, 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 here, we issued it. The original one was only three years, so that's why we, that's where we should fall in. Well, so they went back, they fought it, they lost at the OSHA Review Commission. They took it to the U.S. Court of Appeals, right, which is their, which is their right. Well, they didn't do anybody any favors here. Because not only did they lose their case, the, 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 the appeals court basically came out and said that this, this field operations manual is only a guidance document, and OSHA can decide if they want to go back further. Yeah. So, so um, if you guys are looking to take anybody off your Christmas card list, I would take Triumph Construction Company <laughs> because they opened up a big can of worms for us. Because now legally, what we always thought OSHA had a five-year limitation based on their field operations manual, now they can go back even farther to issue these, these repeat citations. And you, you can, anybody who's ever been issued a citation, you can understand how scary that can be. So um, just understand that there's, a, there's some changing landscape here. Um, the failure to abate. The failure to abate uh, exists when you've been previously 
excited. Um, you said that, hey, I fixed the issue. OSHA comes back in. They said, no, no, you really, you didn't. You didn't do us do what you told us we could do. And these can be up to $12,675 per violation per day. So you start doing the failure to abate, it can quickly go up much higher than a willful or a repeat. Have you seen a uh, failure to abate? I see one. Yeah, I see one because most companies aren't stupid enough to lie to OSHA. Right. Um, so it's really it's what comes into into play. Um, so once we get these penalties, this is what we talked about. There's there's they, OSHA starts from the maximum penalty situation and they work back backwards from there. That quick fix, okay. Um, that quick fix isn't what a lot of people think. That that quick fix really isn't necessarily I fixed it during the inspection, although a compliance officer might, might tell you that. I am never a fan of fixing something during a compliance inspection because at that point everything's alleged. Once I agree with you and I fix it, it's harder for me to argue alleged. So in my opinion, you fix it, you're acknowledging that there's a violation. So my, you know, let the compliance officer get out. Now we talk about get away before we fix anything. Now we start talking about the quick fix. That's us taking this information into OSHA as we get to that informal. Okay, so we can show some goodwill there, that good faith effort. Right. Okay, your size of your company, smaller companies are going to get some pretty significant breaks. OSHA does not want to bankrupt you unless you are an egregious violator. Right. Um, and then they don't, then they're not really worried about your business as much as they are not getting people hurt. Um, but typically they're not going to issue a maximum penalty for a small operator. Um, for example, uh, the, the case that I dealt with today, um, it was a serious violation, $7,660. You know, so it's, it's considerably down from that that maximum penalty, at that almost $13,000 penalty right. now. Your history, you show good faith, and then we get into the gravity. And that gravity is potential, for, or the severity potential of an injury. How likely it is that somebody's going to get hurt, and what the ultimate potential is. Um, for example, um, there's a different severity with me having a housekeeping issue where I had somebody fall and break a leg, as opposed to where if I had somebody fall 15 feet and strike the ground. There's a different potential, you know, severity there. So they will take all that into consideration and use that to reduce your penalty from the start. Um, but we can also use this stuff as arguments when we're trying to reduce penalties. Um, and, and too often what I see is when we get employers when you, who represent themselves, is they don't understand the big picture. And you might try to argue one thing, and, and Carl, what I like to do is I argue from multiple points. Right. And it's not a matter of, hey, I'm gonna throw a bunch of you know crap up against the wall and see what sticks. We're coming at it from a very logical point on multiple points, and basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to give that OSHA compliance officer, that area director, something to sink their teeth into, that they can start, okay, I can get where this guy's coming from. So that's kind of the, what the approach is, and this, this kind of kind of helps lay the foundation. Um, the other piece that we look for when we go into this informal conference, and um, and we're going to talk about um, about some of these. Um, you got to know your why. Know your okay. why. And, and that know your why is why are you here? Um, is, is your why that hey I don't want to pay this much in penalty? That's great. That's great. Because now you know where your, you know, you can draw your line in the sand. Is um, your your why? Hey, it's just the principle of it. You know, hey, look, you know, it's, I understand your company is your baby, and you just don't like the fact that these guys came in and you think they issued you an unfair citation. Right. Know it. Well, Acknowledge it. Did you when you were at a company when you were the uh, corporate safety? Manager, didn't you take a case? I took a case all the way up to a week before trial because the citations were there was multiple citations they were bogus and we it was uh, 
I think fifteen thousand dollars, and I end up spending about fifty thousand dollars in attorney fees and my time right. because of that principle and also that goodwill. Okay, and when we talk about that goodwill, that's a lot of a lot of companies, especially third tier auto manufacturing and construction companies. Your safety record and your quality record are keys to you being able to to bid work. You have to be pre qualified on these at these facilities. Are, are for these other companies. And one of the things that they typically look at is your OSHA citation record. So if you have a poor citation record, a lot of times that can basically preclude you or or, or, or kick you out from doing, yeah, from doing work. work. Yeah. Right, so, so you lose, you know, it's, it's that cost of lost opportunity. And for us, we were a contractor and that principal and that goodwill were really what drove it. And it was a case out in Guam and it was um, adjudicated in, in California, which California still has a federal OSHA presence because of military bases and stuff like that. So it was out in California. We actually flew out to California. We got to the point where we put the compliance officer under deposition. Um, and we drilled him for about eight hours um, with only a lunch break. And it came out. They eventually, on that case, OSHA dropped the case. Um, so we won because of the merit. Right. Um, but if you didn't know what you were doing, you're you're buying, you're basically paying money, and and we were more worried about losing that that loss of future earnings. Right. So that that ex, you know, we, we took fifteen thousand dollars, we spent fifty thousand dollars, but that that well twenty five thirty thousand dollar delta, thirty five thousand dollar delta. We got back is because we didn't lose future work. Okay, right. so that's why a good example of know your why. Know your why. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. The financial was was the least of our worries at that point. Um, and that's my that's my advice to companies is that financial should always be the least of your concerns. Um, you know, we're going to push hard on this other stuff because of the potential cost of repeat, the potential cost of willful of that stuff. So that's always we're always looking for when the next time they're going to come on site. Um, and, and possibly issue citations. Um, what to expect at the informal, and we've kind of touched on this, but it really is, you know, look, you sit down, you have a conversation, you lay everything out, hopefully you can agree. I say 95% of the time you can usually come to an agreement. Yep. Um, and then you, you shake hands or, you know, you issue a letter of formal contest. And that letter of formal contest, be something as simple as I've had clients actually sit there and write it out in, in hand, yep. written, hand it over to them, and we walk out and we, we move down the process, and that's okay. Your approaches, variety, um, you know, there's a technical approach, which is really where I come at. I'm, I'm going to argue the technical merits of the, of the citation, I'm going to argue big picture, right. programmatic stuff, um, you know argue, you know, what do they have in place versus what don't they have in place. Um, you have the procedural, which means that, you know, did OSHA compliance officers follow the, the letter of the law? I've actually had two cases thrown out because of procedural. One was up in Michigan where I had a, um, it was an asbestos abatement job where the My OSHA compliance officer came on site, issued us citations, and we weren't working that day. <laughs> so um, they threw that out. And I had one out in Atlanta, Georgia, get thrown out because um, the compliance officer issued citations based on a fire on an area where there was a small fire. Um, he never saw the area. He just questioned employees, and he was citing physical hazards that he never laid eyes on. So because he never took the time to actually physically do his job and walk in the building, we were able to, to get him, uh, get that one, you know, thrown out as well based on procedural. So it's not a it's not a an uncommon thing. They're getting better, but it's not all that uncommon. And then I'm gonna have Carl talk to you about this unavoidable employee or supervisor misconduct. And this is that argument that I hear from every client, but we trained them and they knew better. Right. How can I or or, or is, as for those of you that follow Ron White, it's how can I fix stupid? 
right? They, they, these guys know better. They know they're supposed to wear their safety glasses. They know they're supposed to wear their fall protection. They know they're supposed to do lockout, tag out. I can't be everywhere at one time. And that's what you call, you know, employee stupidity. <laughs> Carl and I call unavoidable supervisor or employee misconduct. So Right. Yeah, this is, we have used this successfully to avoid citations. Now, this is where, by the way, your documentation is very important. You cannot argue this defense, and this is your opportunity to defend against the citation unless you have good documentation. So first off, you have to have a work rule. Uh, lockout, tagout, I'll just keep back, start going back to that. Lockout, tagout, you have a very well-defined and clearly communicated work rule on the procedure to follow lockout, tagout. So you have to have the work rule that avoids the hazard. You've communicated that to your employees. How do you prove that? You have sign-in sheets and acknowledgement forms where your employee was trained on that work rule. Methods for discovering violations of the work rules. I'll call that near misses. You have some kind of monitoring in your place of employment where you try to discover whether or not people are following the rules. And when they don't follow the rules, you discipline them accordingly for their own safety. This is what you have to show. OSHA needs to see this. You have work rule, you communicated it, they were trained on it, you got the documentation. And when other employees didn't follow this rule, you disciplined them. If you can go in there and show that to OSHA, that establishes that this citation was due solely to this employee who didn't follow the rule. Okay, um, and that's, that's an important one. That's an important one for everybody to understand um, because, and Carl and I probably hear this on every case, and it's that documentation, yep. and it's that enforcement of your safety regulations, and it's your good, robust, consistent, technically sound training programs. Um, you know, it's not that, it's hard to argue employee misconduct on lockout, tagout, if you're only spending 10 minutes on lockout, tagout training. Um, so, you know, this is only, can only be proven if the employer does their part. Yep. Um, and you, you might not like hearing that, but that's the fact of the matter, okay? Um, so, um, you know, it's like I have teenagers, <laughs> and believe it or not, my teenagers do really stupid things. But unless I have given them the given them the proper guidance and given them the proper rules, I can't argue, you know, them being brain dead um, if I'm not doing my job as a parent. That's kind of how this this argument plays yeah, out. Good example. Um, so after you get the citations, we have that informal conference. What are you going to do? Okay, um, you're going to represent yourself, which is fine. But I, I, I if you're going to represent yourself. Um, you need to understand what to expect and you need to understand what's at, at play or you can have a third party such as myself or Carl um, handle it. Um, except for the, you know, aside from the obvious reasons why I prefer that third party, I'm going to give you one that I actually had clients, in fact I just had one of, the, one of these a couple weeks ago where I actually informed my client that I did not want them there. And, and the reason for that is if it's your safety program, if it's your company, and you get cited, it's a very personal, very emotional thing. Absolutely. And too often than not, I've seen, I've taken a client into a into a informal conference and had them stick their foot in my mouth. Um, I've had one client, the one the one willful that um, Carl and I worked on together. Um, actually had the supervisor um, tell the OSHA or the area director, yeah, you know, I understand what you're saying, but sometimes, sometimes production takes precedent over safety. <laughs> I remember that. Okay, <laughs> so I'm here sitting here trying to argue a reduction of a willful, <laughs> and the supervisor basically says, hey, you know what, you're right. <laughs> um, 
to the OSHA, to the area director. So, um, and I also had another case where I sat in on a, on a um, where I did the informal, and for whatever reason, Kim Nelson's our area director here in Toledo. She was pushing back harder on me than I had seen her push before, and me and her kind of got a little crossways. So, which again is another reason why I recommend you know a third party is because it's okay for me to argue with the compliance officer. I hate to see my clients do that because then right. it get, does get personal. I don't take yeah. it personal, and they know how hard we push. Yes. Um, so after this informal, I had the client step out. I pulled Kim aside and said, okay, all some tension here, what happened? And she was just being nice because the vice president of the company that was sitting across the table from me is the one that gave the OSHA compliance officer the information is, yeah, we don't want that out ever. Oh, so, um, so she was being nice, but I took it, you know, tension. She was being nice. She wasn't comfortable calling this cat out on the, on the, on the carpet right there. Um, so, you know, sometimes we make clients that are their own worst enemy. Um, now, what's negotiable? Number one is the cit citation validity. And you know what? We've been successful in getting some citations thrown out based on a technical argument or as we talked about some procedural stuff, right? Um, doesn't happen as much as it used to because our compliance officers are getting smarter. They're getting better. The citation classification is on the table. Um, is there a, you know, uh, going from serious to another than serious? And this becomes important for the willful. Very hard to get a willful down to a serious, but we have been successful at getting a willful down to a repeat. Right. The way that, the reason that becomes important is when you start getting into these, there's, there's one that we haven't talked about called an egregious violation. And that egregious violation is when you are that company or that person working for that company where you just don't get it. And we've got a couple of these here in Northwest Ohio right now that I know they're, they're, they're about a hair's width away from, from hitting that. So what OSHA will do is they'll typically come in and they'll hit you once, and they'll hit you with a, with a series. And they come back in and they'll hit you with a repeat. And then you're still not getting in a willful. And they might hit you for a willful again. And they come back and you're still hurting people, you're still having these problems, they could issue what's called an egregious. And typically with these citations, if I have five pieces of machinery that I haven't locked out, or five people or five pieces of machinery without a machine guard, they see all of them, they will lump those together under one citation and issue it as one willful, one serious, one repeat, right? Well, once you start getting into that egregious, they start issuing those separately. So now I'm not looking at five machine guards lumped together, five, one, one big willful with five different bullet items. What I'm looking at is five different willful. That's the egregious. So it's important that when you're able to get that willful knocked down, and also that goodwill goes a long way. That willful is just a nasty word. Yeah. Um, so you can, that's the, the fine, the fine, and, and the reason and, and I'll, I'll kind of give you a little, little, little bit of a tip out of, out of school, right? Don't ever pay the maximum penalty. Uh, 99 times out of 100, you can probably get at least a 30% reduction. The one this morning, I was able to get a 50% reduction. So we spent 15 minutes, saved almost $4,000. Um, because we were able to go in and give a good argument. Abatement time. Typically, when you get these citations, by the time you get through the informal, the abatement time is already passed. Don't sweat that. These are only alleged violations until you agree to them or the court issues them. So a lot of times when you go in and you'll, like today, um, the abatement date was actually tomorrow. There's no way we can get it done. So we had it pushed out to June 1st, give us time to get the abatement done. Then these program enhancements, and this is an unwritten rule here. These program enhancements are, you know what, Carl, you're my area director. You're, you're being stubborn here. You're not working with me. So what I'm gonna ask you is like, okay, now look, what else can we do to show you how serious we are about moving forward with this safety? If I show you and different program enhancements could be, you know what, I give you a schedule of monthly safety training. 
I agree. I agree to rewrite my entire manual, and I'm going to give it to you to show you the quality of that. So, it's, 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 and, and, and in one aspect, it's kind of inviting OSHA into my house, but in the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm telling them, look, I have nothing to hide. This was truly a blip on the radar. Let me work some other stuff and give it to you to show you how serious we are. And let me show you that I am willing to make a personal and a capital investment into my safety program. And that's where those program enhancements come in. And I've had very good success, and I know Carl's had good success with arguing those and yeah. getting getting penalties reduced, um, getting citation or uh, fines reduced. Um, getting additional abatement time, all that stuff. Um, the other things that you can do, and we mentioned those program enhancements with that informal conference. One of our, one of my favorite um, tactics is um, grouping of citations. So I might, they might issue two citations, but if I say, hey, do me a favor, can you put these two together? And instead of me getting $7,000 here and $10,000 here, can you group them together? So now the max you can give me is $12,000. So it's a way to reduce fines. It's a way to look better on my record. So I don't, now it's not showing me as, as, that I have as many um, citations and my penalty gets really reduced. I got an example here pretty soon that I want to show you where we have a repeat that we're actually able to take citations down from $42,000 down to $17,000 on an amputation case with, number one, getting them to reclassify not the citation, but to issue it under a different regulation, similar regulation. I argued that the that this regulation applied more to this one. Not that there wasn't a violation. I argued that you cited it wrong. This is what they had to repeat on this one on the right hand. On the left hand, they hadn't been cited for that one before. So we took it away from a repeat that way. And then the other one was from grouping some citations together, right? Combining some stuff. And, and it's a it's a it's one that a lot of people don't understand. If you're nice to the area director, the assistant area director, they might offer this, but you typically have to ask for it. Then we get into those program enhancements, which you know, program enhancements are just gonna help your um, help your cause anyway. Um your settlement versus formal contest, you know, making that decision. Look, here, here's here's the deal. If you don't like what you get out of the informal, you might want to settle. You might want to you might want to formally contest it. But you have to know your why. And if you see like one, one thing you, you you don't see up on our screen here, the one thing that's missing is emotional reasons. Look, I don't like the penalty. I, I don't I don't want to pay a hundred thousand dollars for this. Um, the principal, look, this should not be classified as a willful. We're going to formally contest it. Or you're afraid of that loss of future earnings. Um, and I am not, never afraid to go to a formal contest, but you really need to understand if you've gotten the best that you're going to get. And, you, and, and part of this is looking at it from a position of, you know what, it looks like a duck. And it quacks like a duck. It's a duck. You got to be honest with yourself. Again, I'm going to use the teenagers as an example here, right? Now, this would be the equivalent of my teenager skipping school and me going and yelling at the principal because they didn't keep control over at school. But I got to call it what it is. My kid did something wrong. She's wrong. Here's a case with a safety. You know, if you did something wrong sometimes you just got to fall on the sword and you got to eat it um so it's understanding how far you can push and, and on these formal contests we've had good luck with going to formal contests um but i've also gone to a formal contest had the client formally contest one and go to sit down and talk with the area director and they're saying look this is the best you're going to get right so there's no there's really no value in it and we did not have a strong enough case yeah, well, we'll move through this slide quickly so we can get to a couple of the examples so we're not running out of time. Um, formal contest. This is court. So you're going to have pleadings. You're going to have formal court stuff, interrogatories. You 
are going to take time and energy to be deposed and it's going to cost you money. Most of the time you're going to need an attorney. They're um, always, at least if you're going to take the time and money to go formal contest, go to court, you're probably also going to have an expert to support your case from a technical standpoint. So a formal contest is a big deal. Like we talked earlier, you can file a formal contest with the understanding that you want to resolve it early on and you just needed some more time. You tell the solicitor because you're going to, OSHA is going to be represented by a fancy federal litigator, usually out of Cleveland for this area, but sometimes they can come out of Atlanta. The, um, it's, it's a big deal. If you want to take it into court just to get it done quickly to settle it, that's one thing. You move on forward, you're going to take time, energy, it's going to cost you money. So you have to know your why. You have to know why you're doing this. If it's important enough, go for it. The one thing on this, too, just to understand is when you file that formal contest, it usually takes about 45 days for the solicitor to file the complaint in the court. During that time, you still have the ability to work with the area office. Now, what you're going to get, though, is you work with the area office. They're going to make a recommendation up to the solicitor's attorney, and you will have a formal settlement. So that the informal settlement comes off the, the table, but you can still work with the local area office right. to to complete it um, if you if you need to. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. One thing, just to let you know, be careful. We got a phone call this morning from a client where OSHA is char has, is investigating a charge that the employer retaliated against an employee for calling OSHA on an unsafe work site issue. They are very sensitive about that. OSHA is big on whistleblower protection. They are the agency for 23 different federal agencies, and OSHA handles whistleblower issues for all of those agencies. So do not retaliate against any employee contacts OSHA. Um, this is a case that Carl and I actually worked together, and I apologize. Um, I just noticed that I have not updated this slide. Um, this was uh, five serious violations for about 32,000 and one willful for about 87,000. Um, as you can see, we were able through combining, not combing, through combining, I got a title. Um, we were able to go from five serious to four serious and reduce the penalties almost 50% which is pretty significant. Yep. And then the, the willful, um, what, what the, uh, the outcome of that was, they knocked it down to a repeat. And the willful we filed a formal contest on. Correct. They knocked it down to a repeat. And it was for, for about 62,000, yep. I believe. Yep. And this was, a, this was an example where for the program enhancement, this company was in some pretty dire straits with their safety program. And one of the things that OSHA required, that, that Kim Nelson required, is that they um, um, hire a third-party consultant to, to at least for the next year to get them on the right track. Right. Um, this is a case where we had uh, six serious violations uh, for about 39,000. We were able to combine them. We had one vacated, which we had one thrown out, um, and knocked it down to right at 20,000 for three serious. So, um, you know, you go from six to three, um, almost a 50% reduction. Um, here's one where we had four violations, three citations for 42,000. Um, one serious, two repeat, one other than serious. The other than serious was a failure to report properly. Okay. Um, we hit them on that one. We got that one vacated um, because of a procedural. They said failure to report an answer. Amputation. Okay. And the issue with that is they reported the amputation 45 days after the accident. The amputation happened 45 days after the accident. Okay. And they still reported it. Whereas you don't have to report it unless the amputation occurs within 24 hours of the actual incident. Okay. So there is a, there is some procedural stuff that they, they say it, they cited it because we knew the um the regulation. We were able right. to get that one thrown out without anyone. Then they took the, um, the, the two serious, the three, the, the, we went from three violations, we ended up with three violations um, with worth 16,000. They took the two serious, we left those at 5,000, so we had 
one of the repeat reclassified down to another to, to a series, which was we did that because by, by they, they issued a lockout tagout citation, and we talked them into issuing it not as a programmatic deficiency, or not as a training deficiency, but as a programmatic deficiency, which they hadn't been cited under before. So we, we were able to get that that reduced, and then the repeat was only eleven thousand dollars. So you see, we went from forty two thousand down to about sixteen thousand. Um, I honestly, this is probably one of the best cases I've ever I've ever argued. I'm very proud of this one. Yeah. Um, number four, we had five violations, two citations, about ninety-two um, hundred dollars in citations. Um, vacated one, um, took it down to three serious for five thousand. Now, on this one, this is a company that had been cited um, about six months previously for something else. They had an amputation. Uh, on a forklift, and they had not done their forklift training yet because they kept canceling it. But we had a um, had a schedule, right? And we actually, and and on the schedule, the training event was supposed to take place about ten days after the amputation had occurred, previously scheduled. We actually got them to vacate it. Wow. Not because we had it on the schedule. Um, so this is a situation, the first time I've actually ever been able to get a valid citation thrown out. Um, but you did it. Yeah. So, so, you know, this, this mystery or this, this mystique that these folks are just out to get companies um, and are trying to um, screw everybody. It, it's not, it's ex fiction. There's no fact in that at all. Now, there's companies out there who are egregious violators. Um, if you go in there um, as one of them, or if you go in there with a chip on your shoulder, a very unprofessional, they will eat your lunch. Absolutely. Um, but if you go in there very professional with a very well thought out um, argument, they're not going to have um, any issues with working for it, working with you. And here's a situation, and one we didn't get into a lot of times on an employee complaint, they'll do what's called a phone fax. Right. Um, you know, they do a phone fax, you come in, um, do an investigation, you tell them, no, no violation, this is why, or yep, we have a problem and this is how we're fixing it. And they don't inspect, they don't issue citations. I've dealt with three of these this month. Right. None of them have resulted in a, in a citation. Yep. These are pretty, pretty cut and dry. So these are just some examples um, of some of the some of the, the the cases that are out there and some of the potential results without going into a lot of detail. Now with that, if you have any questions, um, please type them in the in the chat box. Um, if not, that's fine as well. Um, I do want to point out that we do have some um, open enrollment classes coming up. Um, and you can go to our website at www.cardinalhs.net. The one I really want to point out to you guys, though, is um, on May 23rd, which is next Wednesday, Carl and I will be doing, um, I guess, the long version of this class. And we go into some of this stuff. We go into a lot more detail. We give you guys a lot more detail about how to handle this. This class, if you sign up, it's free for the first 20 people. Um, I recommend it. It's a class I know Carl and I have a lot of fun doing. It's some really good information. I can't price it any less than free. <laughs> so, um, you know, please make sure that you, you get signed up for that if you're interested in learning a little bit more. Um, you, can, you can sign up uh, through our website um, by going to our open enrollment courses. We also, if you look on the left, you'll see our webinars. We're going to continue to have these free webinars throughout the year. Um, encourage your participation. For the open enrollment classes, we are a SHRM provider for recertification. So if you're on that human resource, uh, certified human resource manager certification um, and you need uh, contact hours, this is for contact hours for basically for free um, if you're interested. So um, with that, um, if there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead and terminate our webinar. Thank you very much for your attention today. And if you have any questions in the meantime, you can get a hold of me at rich at cardinalhs.net. Thank you very much.